My name is Tanya White, and today I want to speak about the women and the exodus. Rabbi Akiva, the very well-known uh, Talmudic personality, said that in the merit of the righteous women we were redeemed from Egypt. I want to ask the question, what was it that Rabbi Akiva saw in these women? The women that we see at the beginning of Sefer Shmot, the book of Exodus chapters 1 and 2, are women whose leadership in some senses births the redemption, births the exodus from Egypt, both in a literal and a met metaphorical sense. At the end of the book of Torah, we have another model of leadership. And there we see the daughters of Slofchad, of a man who died on, in the desert, who ask also for a redemption. And this time it's a redemption of their father's name, of their father's land. Each of these two groups of women, one at the beginning of the exodus process, at the beginning of the redemption, and one at the end as they're about to enter the land, represent two different kinds of freedom, of liberty. If we use the model of, of Isaiah Berlin, the very well-known British uh, philosopher, where he speaks about the idea of negative and positive liberty, it might help us in framing these two narratives. Isaiah Berlin speaks about the idea of negative liberty. For that, he says that's freedom from, based on John Stuart Mill's idea of what a liberal state or, or democratic state looks like, Isaiah Berlin believed that the basic, kind of the basic baseline of liberty was the idea of freedom from. You want to be free from slavery, free from a totalitarian state, free from coercion, and that will provide the way in which we can nurture our liberty. But there is also a, a more enlightened form of liberty, which Isaiah Berlin understood to be what he called positive liberty. That is, what do I take my freedom to? Use it towards. How do I make choices that transcend the self and the immediate needs of the I in favor of the needs of society? So we have these two kind of models, and I see both of these stories the women in some senses are navigating this space between these two models of liberty and they understand that both of these models are imperative for a nurturing and a kind of uh, um, gathering of what freedom and what liberty looks like. Let's focus for a minute on women, Miriam and the women of, of, of the Exodus story. These women have hope but it's not a Pollyannish kind of optimism. They have an ability to see outside of their particular conditional existence. They are able to put the we, to put the bigger picture before the I. In many ways, what they do is they transform their nameless identity, and, and they are nameless. If you look in chapter two, of, of the exodus of, of Josefa Shmot, what you see is that they have no names. None of them are given names. They transform that nameless anonymity that they've been given, that's been imposed on them by their taskmasters, into an active agency. And in that agency, they win back their identity and the identity of their people. And what they do is they birth into an existence a redeemer, Moshe, both in a literal and a metaphorical sense. They use the water to save the child and bring life into culture of death. Very often, times of uncertainty, and we know this from our own experiences over the last four years, five years with corona and the war and everything else that's been going on, times of uncertainty and suffering can cause great anxiety and fear. And in many ways, fear is a narrowing. It's a narrowing where our perspective is limited and our ability to see outside our own perspective has been tempered. And it's in this narrative that the women present an opening, a widening. They offer hope, they offer possibilities, alternative avenues, and in doing so, the fear and the anxiety which narrows us is transformed into an anticipation of a different ending. So there's something beautiful about these women. By the way, we'll get to it a bit later. If we think about the words Mitzrayim, Tzal, it's narrow. And these women open us up. 
I want to now look at the second narrative at the end of the Torah, and that is the daughters of Slavchad. There, they're not anonymous. Their names are repeated twice. In some senses, they provide a rectification, a tikkun, for the namelessness of the women in Shemot who had been born into a society in which they were anonymous, but not Slavchad, are moving into a society in which the names are important. We begin Sefer Bamidbar by with 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 naming with lifting up the faces of the of the soldiers that are being counted we begin sefer shmot with names shmot means names and then the people are transformed into numbers like we know with recent history and even not into numbers into nothingness into oblivion and the women in that oblivion, in that anonymity, they bring the redemption. The Benot Lofchad's names are repeated twice because they, they, they complete the circle. They birth into existence a new law. They, they author literally a passage in the Torah. And in many ways, they represent to me the beginning of the oral law, of the Torah Chayim, of this Torah that is dynamic, that is water, that is moving, that is constantly flowing. They see the bigger picture and they recognize that it's they're not asking for land for their father, for themselves. They're asking for land to um, fulfill the legacy and the name of their father. Again, like the women at the beginning of the Sefer Shmot, they understand that it's not just about the I, but it's about the we. In both narratives, the rest of the nation is stuck in a certain vision of reality. But the women in both narratives transcend that reality transcend that, that that kind of boxed paradigm. Miriam forces them to see outside of the accepted um, understanding, like with the Midrash where she convinces her father to remarry her, her mother, um, and the women with the mirrors, the beautiful, beautiful uh, midrash where the women go and they take they 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 um go into the river and they they bring fish to the men who are in the fields and they hang mirrors up and through the mirrors they come to desire and they bring more children into the world the mirrors are the ability to see more than just the part when we look at ourselves without something reflecting back to us we see only parts of our of who we are, of the self. But when we look in a mirror, we see the whole. The Midrash is conveying a beautiful and profound idea that what women, the message the women gave over to the men who were toiling with terrible labor and couldn't see outside the immediacy of their own suffering, when they put the mirror up, they say to them, look at the big picture. There's more than just the part. There's more than what we just see now. The Benotz Lofchad also forced the people to see more. Whilst many of the people desiring at that moment to go return to Egypt and there's calls to go back, they are looking forward to the land. They are framing the new perspective. They're looking towards the new horizon. In both narratives of the women and Miriam and of Benotz Lofchad, the posture of the women is humble but at the same time assertive. It's hopeful, but also pragmatic. And central to both the narratives is the idea of movement. Miriam and the women we know dance. They take uh, drums and timbrels and they dance as they come uh, to the, after the parting of the sea. The daughters of Slovchad, every single one of their names signifies movement. Freedom liberty, negative and positive, requires consistent curiosity, humility, movement, revision. It's not a destination. We don't say, okay, now we're free. It's a constant journey. Because if we take freedom for granted, like we've seen in the last few decades, we become stayed and stagnant, and therefore, ultimately, freedom actually becomes curbed because we freedom demands that we move outside our comfort zone, that we reassess, constantly reassess our reality, and affirm 
our freedom. We affirm the fact that on the one hand, there's certain contingencies we can't necessarily say change, but on the other hand, we always have a certain degree of freedom and agency to either reframe our reality or to look outside it. And it's a dance, and it's a dance, it's literally a dance between these sometimes opposing principles. It's a movement that breaks the dogmatic structures that often um, pepper our existence and allows us the fluidity of the lived experience to dictate our response. In the narrative of the women from the Exodus story, a, a, a phrase, a verb keeps repeating itself. Vitere, vitere ki tofu. All the time we see the women, see, vitere tayeled, she saw the lad. The women are able to see something that the others in the story cannot. Shifra and Pua see the child on the stones. Yocheved sees the good in her child. Miriam watches her brother. But Paros sees the child rather than the Israelite enemy that needs to be killed. The women in the Midrash see something in the reality that the others do not. As we said, when they hold up the mirror, they see something different to what the men folk see. They see that there's more than a one-dimensional reality that's presented to them. And Moshe is the product of this heightened sight and insight. Moshe has a sensitivity to a higher existence, and that's revealed when he sees the suffering again. He comes out the palace for Tereh, and he sees the suffering. And not only does he see it, the Tereh bisiv lotan. He sees literally into the suffering of the Israelites. He sees the burning bush. And we know that in many ways, the fact that he is chosen comes from the fact that Tsar Lirot, he goes out his way to see. Like the women from who he originates, Moshe sees beyond the given reality and his societal position. He intuits that there's something more. At the end of the Torah, again, as we said, the daughters of Slofchad, whilst the rest of the nation uh, 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 are kind of fixed into this position of anxiety and fear when they're facing the prospect of entering the promised land, the women, instead of this anxiety, they offer a perspective of anticipation and of yearning and of desire. They want to go to the land. They're looking to the future. They're imagining the scenario already. They're imagining the possibilities. They present, like the women in Shmot, a new way seeing. The Sfat Amet, as I said before, tells us that in every generation we have to leave our own Mitzrayim. What does Yitziat Mitzrayim mean for us? It means not that each and every one are slaves and literally slaves going to freedom, no. But every generation has its own form of slavery, its own Mitzrayim, its own strait, its own imposed boundaries that limit our freedom. And when we come to the open sea, like the Israelites did, that's when we need to shift our perspective and to see reality differently. We begin our redemption with the story of, a whim, of women who literally sing a bitter reality into freedom. And we end the Torah with the story of a group of women who birth the oral law into existence. After the Binot Slovchad go to Moshe and they say to him, we, our father died in the desert and we don't want our land, we don't want his land to go to another random person. We want the land to go to us so it remains in his name. Moshe goes to consult with God and God says, yes, hen dovrot slavchad. They, they spoke correctly. They, they knew how to speak. They spoke in the right way. They birthed the idea of the Torah, Shabbat Al-Peh, the oral law that is dynamic and the oral law that is the key to our long survival over centuries of tumultuous uh, 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 events. One is about negative liberty, the story of Mosh uh, Miriam and Moshe coming out of Egypt, and the other is about positive liberty, how we take the, the freedom that we've been given and we use it 
in order to create a society that is sustainable. One asks us, how do we reframe an impossible and ostensibly hopeless reality into a redemptive state of freedom? And the second narrative asks us, how do we ensure our legacy and the legacy of our ancestors survives? How do we take the basic tenets of freedom and develop them into the tools that are needed for a heightened and enlightened existence. But ultimately, both narratives ask us to see beyond the given through a posture of humility, of courage, and of agency. Rabbi Avram Yeshua Heschel, who lived in America in the 1960s, was acutely aware of the threat of unbridled and hedonistic freedom, so much so that many of the things he writes are eerily relevant today. And what he asked us to do when he wrote was to tap into this transcendence that was buried in our hidden reality. He spoke about the idea of radical amazement, and he understood that if we only put on a new set of glasses, a new set of lenses, we would intuit the divinity in every area, and every part of our existence. He famously said, awe enables us to see in the world intimations of the divine, to sense in the small things the beginning of the infinite significance, to sense the ultimate in the common and the simple, to feel in the rush of the passing the stillness of the eternal. When we sense the eternal in the mundane, when we see beyond what is born, is a responsibility that transcends the immediate needs of our own existence, then we are exacting not just negative liberty, but also positive liberty. And whilst the the, the Torah ends with the story of the Benot Slovchad, the Tanakh ends, the Bible ends, with the story of another woman. A woman who, prompted by Mordecai, her uncle, according to most Mepharshim, most commentaries, also ultimately understood that she had to see beyond her given reality. We know that when he was faced with the demise of his people, Mordecai turns around to he tears his clothes and he goes and he, he cries a great cry and he comes to Estelle and he turns around to her And he says to her, you need to listen to your people. If you lock your ears off to what is going on at the moment, people will be redeemed. And he says, we don't know. If why you're here, we don't know what's going on. We are not, uh, we're not in a, a place of open miracles where ev- or, or prophecy where we understand and know everything. But what we do know is at this moment, you are in a certain place, in a certain time, in a certain position that allows you to take a step towards saving your people. And Esther turns around and she says, yes, I will do it. Go and fast and tell the people, Lech knosek hola yodim. go and gather all the people together. Kasher vaditi avaditi. And if I, if, I, if I basically get destroyed because of this, if I die, I die. But I know I've done something for my people. I know I've transcended my own individual parochial existence for the good, for the better, for the responsibility of my people. If you listen carefully to the words of Mordechai, you might detect something else. He uses the term im hacharesh takrishi. Now, in an earlier model of salvation by the Yam Suf, which we talked about when we're talking about the women Moshe tells the people is they've got the Egyptians coming behind and they've got the Yam Suf, the, 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 the sea in front of them and they're stuck they're in literally in a strait okay they're in that not just in a physical sense but in a mental sense they're in a place of fear of anxiety a place where they can't move and Moshe says to them God will fight this battle for you Hashem yilachem lachem God will fight this and you, most translations say, you hold your peace. You remain passive. God will do this for you. He will be the active agent of redemption. But the words here, tachrishun, match, parallel 
what Mordechai says, Im HaKaresh Tachrishi. In the first model of redemption, God fights the battle for the people. They need to only see the miracles through their eyes. They use to use their one-dimensional vision to understand that God is doing this all for them. But in the later model of the Tanakh, God is not openly present, as we know. Also, his name is not in the Megillah. And also, it's very difficult for us to see. We have to detect his footprints through the story. We need to listen. And that's part of the Megillah. You have to hear it. You have to listen carefully to intuit the divine fingerprints. Im hacharesh tachrishi. Says Mordechai Tester, if you close your ears, not if you close your eyes, if you close your ears at this time, you will not hear God calling the Ayaka call. We're no longer in the place where you only have to see the miracles and wait for them to happen, says Mordechai Tester. It's not Hashem Yelachem Lachem Vatem Tachrishum. We're not in that model anymore. Mordechai says to Estelle, we are in the model that not everything can be seen. But if you open your ears to the call of the divine, to the Ayeka call that we begin our journey as humanity towards, if you open up your ears and hear God calling you to take responsibility to your people, then you will detect the divine footprints in every single element and every single phase of Jewish history. And that is exactly what Estelle does. And through that, she fulfills that new model of miracle that requires humans and God to work together in covenantal agency to redeem the world, to redeem the Jewish people. Today, we live in a world of sound bites and noise and we've become deafened to the real internal deep call of something beyond the self. The call, the radical amazement that Heschel was trying to awaken America in the 1960s to this divine, intuitive, intuitive divine call that he said we had to listen for. Today, more than ever perhaps, we've seen a generation of Esthers and Mordechais, of Miriams and Bat Paros and Benot Slovchads, a generation who understand, who know how to take responsibility. This intuition speaks both at the level of moral responsibility to heal and to witness the suffering of others exactly like Moshe does, to see the pain like, the, like Bat Paro does, like the women of the Exodus, but also to see and to anticipate the miracles. And it takes great courage to sit in the pain and the reality and witness the suffering, the suffering of so many people, the suffering of the hostages, the suffering of the families, the suffering of the people who have lost people, the suffering of people who haven't seen their husbands and loved ones months on end, the suffering that continues and continues to sit in that place, to witness that, but at the same time, to anticipate a better time, greater possibilities, unimagined endings, redemption, and actively, actively to work towards that. It's not a surprise that Rabbi Akiva is the one who speaks about the righteous women, who sees them, who understands what they were doing because he too anticipated redemption. He too constantly saw the bigger picture. picture. He understood the courage and the resilience of the women because he himself had to rebuild time and again, time and again. He too bore witness and was the recipient of unbearable suffering. And he too had the foresight and the tenacity to reframe reality and anticipate redemption. On Motzei Shabbat, we just had Saturday night, we witnessed a miraculous divine saving hand. It's true. If we look at the facts, we may deny God had anything to do with it. And there will be plenty who did. But if we open up our ears, im hacharesh tachrishi be'et hazot, do not deafen yourself 
to the calling. We will hear a clear and distinct divine call to us. The call that says, I am here helping you, but you also have to take responsibility. And whilst we must celebrate the miracle that we all witnessed, we also need to use it as a springboard to recognize that maybe God is calling us to continue the redemptive measure and process ourselves, to witness and hear the pain of our people and actively participate in alleviating it in any way that we can and in aiding in any way that we can the redemption of our people from what has been one of the most difficult uh, difficult phases in our history for many, many years. May this Pesach be the beginning of the redemptive process. May it give us back our liberty, our true liberty, as a people, as humans, and as the Jewish people, so that we are able to continue the journey of positive liberty towards a better, more beautiful, and more united people. Wishing everyone a Chag Kasher Sameach. It should be a wonderful, fruitful, and enlightened Pesach for all.